Good afternoon. Hello, everybody. I'm Blair Thomas, and I'm the artistic director of the Chicago International Puppet Theater Festival. And I want to welcome you here to the second panel of the Ellen von Vukenberg Puppetry Symposium, sponsored by the School of the Art Institute in collaboration with the Puppet Festival. And uh, we're all zooming in here on this online forum uh, on a sunny day, but cold here in Chicago. And I uh, just wanted to acknowledge that the, the building that the fine arts is in where our offices are, as well as all the, the theaters and venues that the festival is happening in across the city, sit on the land of the Anishinaabe nations, peoples that were that had surrounded those wondrous Great Lakes. I can actually see Lake Michigan here, um, the cold waters from here. Uh, it's a, a beautiful region. It, it included the Potawatomi and the Peoria and the Sauk tribes. And uh, they have been the stewards of these grounds for centuries. And for this, we express our gratitude. Uh, this afternoon's panel is uh, happening now online, and we're also recording it in collaboration with Howl Rounds. Some of you all may be tuning in through the, the, the Howl Round network, and, and others may be coming in directly through Zoom. Uh, those of you on Zoom, you can, you can uh, send us questions in the chat as the as where the question section opens up at the end and um those on how round can do similarly and, and those questions will get to our moderator um and uh there's also there's a, a an option to see the close captions that you can on setting on the bottom of your screen you can it says live transcript cc and you can you can just click that little thing and then you can see the words appear as they're spoken i'm watching my words be yes so uh uh well i am with great joy getting to present uh the the our moderator who is was uh the, the principal person the principal person in making the plastic bag store project come to chicago julie moeller is currently serving on the board of the Puppet Festival, but she is an environmental advocate and an active volunteer and philanthropist uh, who has them, the model of plant seeds for trees for others to sit under. And she's been passionate about educating about the environment and about sustainability, specifically about eliminating single-use plastics. She's on them has been on a mission to decrease the corporate plastic production and consumer use. And, and so she found the plastic bag store on her own. And uh, we had been, uh, had worked with um, Robin Frohart in our past festival and knew about her project. Uh, and then we uh, got to meet uh, Julie and uh, that, collaboration has begun and uh, we have been working uh, very strong for the past year to bring this project to Chicago. Um, uh, Julie uh, has, she has been involved in sustainability certificate programs and community colleges and she she traveled to Bali and she to work on a cleanup mission and uh, served on community boards and doing a lot of grassroots campaigning. Um, and uh, besides, uh, serving as a volunteer with the One Earth Film Festival. She is on the board of directors of the Chicago International Puppet Theater Festival. And uh, so without further ado, I turn our panel over to Julie. Great. Thanks, Blair. I'm really excited to be part of the, the festival this year that's, that's happening despite all obstacles. And I'm so excited that we were able to bring the plastic bag store to Chicago and right on Michigan Avenue at the Wrigley Building. So I hope um, a lot of you have been able to see it. And um, today we have um, uh, Dr. Sasha Atkins with us, as well as Robin. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Sasha first, and then we'll hear from Robin. Uh, and Sasha has some slides to share with us, as does Robin, and, and we'll start the discussion. Okay. Uh, 
Sasha Atkins holds a master's degree in international health and a PhD in environmental studies and teaches environmental health at Loyola University, Chicago's School of Environmental Sustainability. They are author from Disposable Culture to Disposable People, The Unintended Consequences of Plastic. Um, it's this book. It's actually really full of great information about uh, plastics, polymers, what we're doing to society with the disposability of all the single-use plastic. Um, it's a great book. I also want to thank Sasha for um, inviting Robin into her class that she was teaching on plastics and thank Robin for being there. Um, it was a great discussion among the students and, and people that are going to be helping us with this plastic pollution problem well into the future. So with that, I'd like to introduce Sasha. Thank you so much, Julie. It's really an honor to be here today. And I also am very grateful to you and to Robin for making my January term plastics class um, much more useful to the students with your presence there. So one of the things that I admire and have hope in about art is its ability to change the dominant narrative. So I thought today what we would go over would be my wish list, if you will, of how we can shift these conversations around plastics. So I'm sure you've all seen that by 2050, there will be much in the ocean. I suspect, but don't have data to prove that it may already be uh, the case that there's more plastics than fish in the ocean because we haven't been measuring what's contained in the biomass, what fish have swallowed, um, nanoplastics. We don't have a good idea of how much is really on the sea floor, but it's not just an ocean's problem. I grew up living on a sailboat for seven years and I do feel that the ocean is my spiritual home. And that is how I became involved in studying plastics and working to try to reduce their production. But what I've come to see is it's much, much bigger. And I think that this part of the story about the air and the land isn't yet in the public consciousness. Next slide, please. This is one of the scary statistics that the total mass of plastics ever produced, those in use and those that have not been incinerated, because unless it's burned, it's all here with us. Very small amounts have been eaten by microbes, but um, the total mass of plastics already exceeds the total mass of all living mammals. And I have a study up here that shows that if we don't consider plants, if we're just looking at animals, there's already twice as much plastic as there are uh, animals by weight on the planet. Next. Which means that we have already passed a planetary boundary for what is called novel entities, which includes the whole category of synthetic polymers and other synthetic chemicals that are not polymerized. So put together, we have already put so much of these anthropogenic, often toxicants, into the water, the land, and the air, the, more than the capacity of the planet to process it, to break it down, to make it safer. We've already passed that planetary boundary and this is what it looks like. Next. We're blurring the boundaries between what is anthropogenic and what is quote nature. I personally feel that one of the problems we have is this idea that there's a separation between humans and the quote environment, between nature and what's urban, but this is called a plastiglomerate. 
And it's embodying the blurring of these boundaries for us in a very visceral way. So what you're seeing here is plastic that became part of the rock. This particular one, they believe that it was at a campfire where some of the plastic melted into the rock, but we are creating a layer on the planet of plastic debris. The sand that you see next to the rock, next to the disposable pen, which is by the way, also plastic, I've read studies that show that much of that sand is not weathered rock anymore. It's weathered plastic. Next. Next slide, please. So this is the article that made quite a splash saying that we're no longer in the geological era called the Holocene. Now we are in the Plasticene. Next, please. And the response by those who are profiting from the manufacture of all of these polymers, all of these chemicals, is that it's useful, that it's indispensable, and that as long as we, quote, keep it out of the environment, and we always see these words, manage it properly. As long as we manage it properly, there won't be a problem. And this leads people to think that as long as we keep it out of the ocean, then it won't be harmful. I used to be one of those who would cut the six pack plastic rings with scissors so that it wouldn't entangle uh, birds or other creatures and thought that I had done my part and now it was okay to use them. But what I've come to see as I've studied plastics is that once you've manufactured it, it is in the environment. And the only options we have for waste are to move it around in space. Often we move it from wealthier areas where it's disposed of to black and brown communities, low income communities, in what is called, um, I call toxic colonialism. Some have termed waste colonialism. So we move it around in space, we bury it in the ground and hope that future generations will know what to do with it because it won't disappear buried in the ground. Or we move it from one form to another. So from a solid waste problem to an air pollution problem by incinerating it. There's equipment on some of these incinerators which are euphemistically termed waste to energy, um, even thermal recycling, but when those filters are full, something must be done with them. Those chemicals didn't go away. In fact, as you're burning plastics, new toxicants are created. So those filters themselves are often incinerated or sent to a low-income community of color to be buried in the ground. And so what we've been programmed to believe is that recycling is the solution, but recycling is only prolonging the time until it is either incinerated or buried in a landfill or just released to continue moving through the environment. It's always in the environment. It's just moving through the environment in different ways. Next, please. So here are some examples of how this plastic moves through the environment. You may be familiar with the song, the earth, the air, the fire, the water, return, 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 return. Here are the ants are carrying the plastic around the earth. The bird is eating mosquito larvae that have eaten plastic. The mosquito larvae are in the water. As the birds eat them, they return to the earth. Chemicals like PFAS chemicals that are used to put out fires, those are also technically a synthetic polymer, are moving into the water, our drinking water. And as these chemicals and tiny bits of plastic move through the food webs, next, they're moving through our bodies as well. 
One statistic shows that we are eating the equivalent of a credit card a week in microplastics. And some researchers are saying, but we don't yet know if that's harmful. But as I've done literature reviews on the chemicals that are used to make these plastics, both the monomers, the building blocks, all the additives, the catalysts, the accidental products of the reaction, we know that many, many, many of those are definitely toxic to us. And so as it moves through us, the question is, is it being absorbed through our gut into our bloodstream? Some studies have shown that that is the case, that it is moving through the placenta. There have been tiny bits of polystyrene, which when expanded is styrofoam, found on the baby side of the placenta. There have been tiny plastics in the stool, the poop of all the people studied. And some of the most common plastics in our poop are pictured here. Polyethylene terephthalate, which is what makes up single use plastic water bottles and polypropylene, which is one of the one of the uses of that is yogurt containers. But what has been found in human stool is tiny fibers of these things. So that implies that maybe the polyethylene terephthalate bottle was used to make a Patagonia fleece jacket. And when you wash that fleece jacket, thousands of fibers are released into the water. When you um, are handling it, it's released into the air and we breathe that. And so these are moving through the environment. Next, please. And one of the concepts that I've been fascinated by is this idea of toxic trespass, that we should have a right to say what is put into our bodies. This picture of the placenta with the fetus is showing that as um, Ken Cook, the head of environmental working group likes to put it, babies are born pre-polluted. They have no say in that. But we can extend this concept also to wildlife. They did not choose to be polluted with microplastics. We look at uh, plants that are taking micro and nanoplastics and their associated chemicals up through the root systems. Um, what is the way that we can stop polluting the planet with plastics and begin the process of cleanup? And in order to imagine that, we need the imagination of artists. And that is what I charge you with today. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. That uh, I know it can be really overwhelming. The, I've gone through that journey myself. I used to cut my plastic as well. And as an advocate, I started you know, with recycling with my kids. And as I learned more, I learned that we have to come up with stronger you know, um, advocacy and informing people. And that is one of the reasons that, you know, I you know, used to do the beach cleanups with my kids and the recycling, but I, you know, with 40% of our plastic being all single use plastic, you know, it's really time to think about what we're leaving behind, what we're doing to our bodies and, and how we want to, you know, for future generations. So when I read the article on the plastic bag store, um, well, first of all, I had about you know six or seven friends send it to me as well because they knew my obsession with plastic. But when I read about it, I thought, what a new and fresh way to you know ex you know show people the problem and without a bunch. And what I love, uh, Robin, is that it's, you know you walk into the store and it's it's humorous, but it it gets across the the problem 
And it doesn't throw a bunch of facts at you. You know, I've stood in front of people and said, oh, you know, plastic bag only lives for 12 minutes, the average life. And, but, you know, until you really can be in the store, I think it's really a powerful message. So um, you have to excuse me. I'm going to read your bio just so I don't miss anything. So um, I just want to introduce Robin. Frau Hart is an award-winning artist, puppeteer, puppet designer, and director living in Brooklyn, New York. Frohart's performance and puppetry based work has been presented at St. Anne's Warehouse and Here Arts in New York City, as well as national venues, including the Pittsburgh International Festival of Firsts and the Next Now Festival in Maryland. Her films have been screened at the Telluride Film Festival, Aspen Short Fest, Maritime Film Festival, and the Parish Museum and Puppets on Film uh, Festival at BAM. Her original play, The Pigeonine, uh, debuted in 2013 as part of the Chicago International Puppet Theater Festival and was hailed by the New York Times as a tender, fantastical symphony of the imagination and has been translated into German, Greek, Arabic, and Turkish. She has received a Creative Capital Award and a Distel, Distel Fellowship from Carolina Performing Arts for the Plastic Bag Store, which premiered in partnership with Times Square Arts in 2020, as we all know, right as COVID started, and is touring now both in the US and abroad. She's been the recipient of Made in New York Women's Fund Grant Award and Guggenheim Fellowship, among other awards. She's a McDowell Fellow and a member in good standing of both the Walgreens and the CVS programs. <laughs> so with that, I turn it over to um, Robin. I would like to add one thing is now Robin's film is gonna be um, featured in the One Earth Film Collective in Chicago in March. So we can add that to your resume in the future. <laughs> so thank you. Great. Yeah, um, thanks for having me. And I'm glad that we can still do this online. Um, so I guess um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the project for those who don't know. Um, this is a picture of the plastic bag store uh, in Times Square. Uh, and so the plastic bag store is, a, is an installation and um, immersive film. Uh, but basically, it, it's a fake grocery store in a real storefront uh, in which everything is made out of plastic bags, uh, everything inside plastic bags or single use plastic. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, these are sort of some examples. So um, we collected all different kinds of bags and containers and lids and bottles and sculpted them into, you know, pretty elaborate produce section. Um, and we also designed a bunch of our own labels. If we can go to the next slide, I think maybe there's uh, yeah. So we like made a whole meat department, you know, those are all used meat trays. Uh, and then we designed some of our own original packaging and then, you know, filled those boxes with more plastic crap that we collected. Uh, next slide. Um, we have like a whole magazine section. And so, yeah, the idea is, you know, it's basically one joke repeated 1 million times <laughs> that it is a store that only sells bags and that everything is all bags, bags, bags all the time. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Uh, cigarettes, <laughs> um, a lot of detail. Every, all of the boxes have like recipe lists and games on the backs of cereal. And there's a pretty elaborate bakery that I don't have a picture of here, but we can go to the next slide. Um, you know, all of this is, uh, this is a, some of the bottled water that we have at the store, which is uh, Pacific Geyer, which is, you know, sort of representing the the gyres in the ocean where all of the like broken down pieces of plastic are 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 gathering as sort of what the slurry looks like out there unfortunately uh, next slide um, yeah and so basically you know the the installation itself you know sits sits in a real storefront right now it's in in the bottom floor of the Wrigley Building here in Chicago um, but as I was, you know, researching um, plastic pollution, as I came up with this idea, because originally the idea was just to make this funny installation, just to sort of, you know, highlight how much packaging I was encountering on my trip to the grocery store. It, it seemed so funny. I thought I would like turn it up to 11 um, and see how ridiculous we could make it. 
Um, and so as I was like designing these products and thinking about the project, I, 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 I read that, you know, that all the plastic that's ever been created um, still exists somewhere, um, you know, because nothing eats plastic, right? It just breaks down into smaller pieces. But, you know, the, the, I, the thought that a, a straw that I used for a Happy Meal in the 80s might be somewhere still floating around is a really kind of abstract thought. And it, it sort of made me think, you know, that if like a, a Greek pot, um, you know, that we, that's thousands of years old, that we still have those, then we're definitely, people thousands of years from now are surely going to have water bottles. Um, and that those are sort of the, the, the pottery shards of our era. And uh, I have a, my previous work has been I've made installations and, and, and sculpture before, but I, uh, my last project was a, a puppetry play um, called The Pigeoning, which I brought to Chicago in 2019. Uh, and it's, you know, it's very narrative driven. And so I, I started the, to conceptualize this story that would fit inside the plastic bag store and that the plastic bag store itself um, would transform into a theatrical space in which we would tell this story. Um, and so, this is like a scene from the first part of the puppet show. There's several different styles of puppetry that we use, um, but the show starts in the ancient past and it's a shadow puppet play about <clears throat> someone in, in ancient Greek times who, um, you know, everyone has like a beautiful vase that they carry around and uh, a young man invents uh, a single use disposable vase. Uh, in this time and start selling single use disposable vases in the market and it, it causes a lot of problems. Um, they start collecting and he starts importing um, uh, vases and you know basically bottled water from other other parts of the of the world too and it's basically just framing what we're doing with bottled water but in the context of this ancient Greek civilization it, it's actually quite funny. Um, and so that's the first part of the play. It plays sort of ancient past, present day, and far off future. Um, and the the present day character who I don't have pictured here, but you know, she she works in a museum in our time and is sort of an admirer of these pots from the past. Um, and she's a custodian of the museum and sort of the conduit through which all the you know garbage from the museum gets passed. <laughs> you know, she's constantly cleaning up. Um, and uh, she 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 sort of makes the connection that uh, her plastic water bottle could perhaps last as long as a, a as a vase in the future. And so she um, she writes a message to the future and puts it into a, a a plastic bottle inside of a bag with some other items and drops it into the trash, which is sort of like a a portal to the future. Which I sort of liked the idea of a plastic of a of a trash can being like a a portal into the future because you think that that stuff's going somewhere but it's not going anywhere it's sticking around so um if you can go to the next slide um uh, we watch sort of uh her trash uh make this journey from the present day to the far off future and this is another style of storytelling that we use this is a, a an all cardboard uh it looks like an animation, technically it's puppetry, um, but we watch uh, her bag of, of plastic trash make this journey from the present day into the far off future, all in this sort of like sped up cardboard animation. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, and then it's discovered by this guy in the future, uh, unearths her plastic bag and uh, takes apart, um, you know, he finds the message in the bottle, but it's all been faded and lost to time really, except that she had written part of it on uh, a CVS receipt. And the only letters that are legible are most valued customer at the bottom of the receipt. And so he sort of misinterprets her, um, misinterprets that to mean that most valued customer, that she was the most valued practitioner of the ancient customs and therefore incredibly important. And therefore all of these items that he's found are extremely valuable and have a lot of significance. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, so this is sort of him as he starts to collect more and more plastic artifacts and he's constantly misinterpreting them and what they are and what they did and how important they were to us. This is him holding a toothbrush, which he 
he kind of identifies with as a human figure because they have the same facial hair. Uh, next slide. Um, and so, oh, this is another part of the cardboard film that we sort of see the museum that Helen had worked at sort of post-apocalyptic submerged, uh, but we can go to the next slide. Um, and so then the audience, in the end, this future character creates a museum um, of the museum of the most valued customer in which all of all of the artifacts that he's found are, are on display and all completely wrong <laughs> what he thinks everything is. Uh, I think there's another, one more slide here. Um, Oh yeah, there's probably a couple. So it's like, you know, a lot of things that, you know, I really like the idea of things that we think of as completely invaluable and mass produced and meaningless, like being, you know, having so much significance and value in the future. Uh, and I think there's one more slide. Yeah, so he think because he found a message in the bottle from her, he thinks that all bottles contain messages and that they were like letter carriers. And he thinks that these, uh, lids are our compasses. Um, and so the audience then, you know, sees these parts of the story are presented within the grocery store. And then as things like so a lot of the grocery store shelves and displays transform into uh, playing spaces and, and audience seating. And then at the end, the audience gets to like tour in real space, this museum that's been hidden to them until then. Um, and so, yeah, I really, um, yeah, this I, I was really interested in just, you know, telling this story and giving some sort of historical or just context um, um, for how long this stuff lasts, because I think it's so just, just designed to be invisible. It's designed to move in and out of our hands and be gone. Uh, and not to be thought about ever again, um, but it really is, it's really quite permanent. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's funny to think of these things being in a museum, but it's, that's the reality. And um, it's interesting because that's not really probably how we want to be remembered, <laughs> um, but, it, but it probably is. Um, and so, you know, I think with the plastic bag store, I, you know, you know, everything, you know, the, all of the just overwhelming facts of plastic pollution, um, it can be uh, really tragic and can feel overwhelming. And I, I feel like that. Um, I think it's really uh, easy to sort of um, try not to think about it or just be like, well, well what can I do? Um, and so I, I guess I was sort of trying to, you know, this is my this is me processing my feelings about it uh, and trying to, you know, this is the one, this is the thing that I do. So this is how I'm approaching the project or the problem. Um, but also just to give people a, a, a more engaging and humorous and, and way, way to approach this stuff without feeling so overwhelmed and hopeless that hopefully we like if we can like laugh at ourselves we can kind of process this a little our feelings about it and then maybe move on and try to do something about it um and we have a, a you know in the in the store in the wrigley building we we have a, a big qr code um that people can scan and it will connect them to local groups um this is something that really helped put together um, to help people connect locally with, with some of the activism that's going on around, around the issue. Because uh, a lot of these things do require action locally. Uh, that seems to be the way that most um, plastic bag bans and any sort of legislation um, seems to be happening. So it's great that we can help connect people in that way. Um, yeah. Unmute myself. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Robin. That was that was a great overview for those of you who haven't seen it. I would encourage if you have a question to put it in the chat or raise your hand um, for either Robin or Sasha. Um, I was going to ask. Uh, you know, I did see the performance on opening night, and you know, I did hear a couple people when they were leaving say, you know, I you know, oh, I feel so guilty, and um, 
you know, I know that's not really your, your intention, but it is a common response. And then people like Helen, you know, don't know what to do. And I was just wondering, like, how do you, how important was it for you to have the satire, you know, because it is with the gravity of the, the production, you know, how did you balance that? Yeah, I mean, I tried to pack it full of as many jokes as possible. Okay. Um, I, I understand that feeling guilt. I feel really guilty too, but I, I don't know. It doesn't, it's not really our fault necessarily, you know, like it's, um, we don't have a lot of choices about where a lot of our food and, and beverages come from in a lot of ways. There's cer certain choices that we can make. Surely everyone could reduce what they use. Um, but I think that it's, uh, yeah, that, that it's on us to recycle all this stuff is, and it, 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 it's a little bit of a misdirection. I feel like it's on the manufacturers and the people who are making it, but I think that, you know, I definitely don't aim to make people, I, my hope is that people don't feel too bad. I think it's just, you know, uh, just giving some context and and putting it in the people's brains and and consciousness um, that you know I think that it will help. Though there has to be a greater cultural shift, I think yeah. that happens that makes this undesirable enough enough so that manufacturers stop. I mean, I think it's going to take everything. There has to be personal choices. There has to be legislation um, of there, but there also just has to be. Um, enough people who who understand uh, and that will change the you know sort of the the way we think as, as a, a society I hope. yeah it's it's good to start with the laughing and then look at yourself and then what can I do for the greater you know yeah. society with legislation I agree so um, Sasha how do you um, you know you're teaching students uh, you know how how do you keep them from being so <laughs> dismayed or, you know, um, when you're talking about this? Well, I think that it's important, as you were saying, Robin, to go back to the corporate responsibility and um, point out that the Crying Indian ad from Keep America Beautiful was reframing this whole thing as a litter problem when, in fact, they were just fighting a bottle bill and the whole carbon footprint idea was created by fossil fuel companies. So there's all of this put on us to make us feel bad about ourselves. And I do want my students to be angry. I want that to move them into action, that um, this isn't simply something that individual choices can solve. It's a collective problem. And I want to point to examples of art and examples of activism that show us how we can make different choices collectively. Yeah, I, I like what you said, Robin, uh, one time that kind of one thing that spurred, not just when you were at the grocery store, they were triple bagging your items, you know, and you were like, ah, and I, I've had tons of aha moments as well. My aha moment is, um, is that you used to open cartons you know, you didn't have the little plastic and then the little plastic inside. And I remember just opening that one day and the plastic tab broke. And I thought, you know, why can't I just open this like a carton? I mean, who made yeah, it? Like, we already solved that. Problem. Yeah, I know. Well, well, who like, made the decision, right? So or that now like eggs coming in plastic. It's like, why are we? We already yeah. had solutions, you know, and, and now it's like now you can get fancy ones that come in cardboard again or something you know, yeah, like, but if you pay more <laughs> but it's just like yeah it's really weird to move backwards I mean that's what people are often are like well we'll have to invent all these new solutions or like how are we going to live without it and it's like you don't even have to use your imagination like just ask your mom what they did like you know it's really just like one generation you know it's like it we is weren't, we weren't dehydrating constantly I tell my kids that I used to go to bottled water. Yeah. Yeah. That I used to go to, I went to Florida for the first time in ninth grade and we brought back strawberries and we had them on our lap on the plane because you couldn't get them in Iowa in the winter. And, it, you know, they're like, what? <laughs> you know, <laughs> just so, but do you have any um, like plastic items, Sasha, that you're just like, like, what the heck? <laughs> 
Well, the plastic items that bother me are the ones that are hygiene theater right now mm. that are giving people a false sense of security. So all of this packaging that has for your safety, we've sealed it with an extra layer of plastic. Um, we see with the pandemic, all of that taking off and we're trading biological threats for chemical ones. And that really bothers me. But I guess the thing that made me the most angry was many, many years ago, I was in the airport in Miami and I saw them wrapping suitcases with saran wrap. They would be put on a spindle and then wrapped in layer upon layer. And that was designed to keep your luggage safe in the cargo hold so that people wouldn't open it, I guess, if your lock isn't sufficient. So I just felt like that was yeah. really um, unnecessary. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. The, in, the, in the pandemic for a while, many coffee shops like wouldn't accept a personal cup. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd be like, can you put your my latte in here? And they'd be like, <laughs> oh, we can't take your personal belongings back here because of COVID. And then, but they would take my filthy Money. $20 bill. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just like, yeah. yeah, when it, yeah, there's a lot of that like hygiene theater. Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, another question is that, uh, so I know that you maybe, did you, you started with the plastic bag store installation and then, and then you wanted to tell a story. Why did you feel that? puppetry was maybe you know the best way to convey you know uh, such a large you know problem and how, how did that fit into telling the story um well it's yeah it's definitely like a form that I was already pretty immersed in and I I um I find that people like trust puppets a little bit more than they trust people um there's like a certain layer of judgment that they don't you know, have like if a person came out and was giving you this lesson, you might be a little bit more defensive or I don't know, like when an actor walks on stage, um, you're kind of your brain is like evaluating them as a person, you know, they're an actor. First of all, you know, they're not really if an actress played Helen in the movie, you know, you know, she's not really Helen. Um, she's somebody playing Helen and you're like evaluating her performance and you know you're sizing her up or are you attracted to her do you like what she's the choices she's made like there's all this kind of like stuff going on but like when the puppet Helen is there it's like she is Helen she's not someone playing Helen she is that character 100% all the time um, and puppets already kind of like become they, you know because they like represent humans they're sort of already metaphors in a way. And so they're, um, they're kind of great, like um, representation, like every man's or something. They already like represent something. So they're sort of these great sort of like symbolic characters that, um, that I think it's easy to, to, uh, to tell stories that way. And people are already like, they're engaged on it in a new way when they watch puppetry. Yeah, makes sense. Do you have anything to add with that Sasha or you can nod in your head in agreement that we can kind of relate more to Helen and yeah yeah um when I watched the film it was so easy to let my guard down and be touched by the characters and take the story in I really think that it was um a magical world that we were entering and I really appreciated it Robin no oh, thank you I, I, one thing that kind of struck me, so reading Sasha, your book, you say um, that we, uh, your book emphasizes we don't need disposability, we need authentic relationships with neighbors, places, and ourselves. And I mean, do you, do you think that could be part of the solution with, you know, single use plastic? Mm -hmm. I see a lot of people turning to plastic as a way to separate themselves from each other. Here's something virgin that's never been touched. It's wrapped in shrink wrap and no one's ever put their hands on it before, which is ridiculous because of course a worker made it maybe in conjunction with a machine, but we're wanting to like that suitcase wrapped in saran wrap. We want to cocoon ourselves away from others and have things that are just mine. And I I love the idea of thrifting and secondhand that we can 
pass things down that have stories attached to them. Here, this is from my grandmother. Let me tell you when she got it. And now you can use it. And I think that relationships promote trust. And if we had more trust, we wouldn't need all of this protective wrapping around ourselves. Um, my core philosophy is that the way we treat things becomes the way we regard ourselves and each other. So if we think of everything as only instrumentally valuable, then we see ourselves as only something with use value. Am I productive today? Yes, good job. What is that? If we had an inherent value recognized for ourselves and each other, then we wouldn't need to dispose of things once they had a scratch or once they were imperfect. And I really feel that this is an environmental justice issue because then that becomes how we treat people who are considered disposable. So I have a, thank you. I, I agree. And I, Robin, I have a follow-up to that. And then we're going to open it up to some questions. If you, like I said, raise your hand or put it in the chat, please. And we're happy to share. Um, so I don't know if this was direct, but I think of disposability and being kind of isolating. And, uh, you know, I think about, you know, the block party where you bring your plates, or you bring your dish and your casserole. And Robin, when I was watching the film, I noticed that Thaddeus was really the only one who had interaction with other people. And Helen and, you know, the explorer seemed very isolated in their world. And, and I, I didn't know if that was just something I... I was thinking, or if you had any thoughts on that, and just that you think that the future is going to kind of be this lonely place. <laughs> so, well, I definitely thought of them both as kind of the Helen and the future guy to be lo lonely characters and then to be connected in this way, you know, mm -hmm. by their, by the things that, by the objects they had both touched, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I hadn't really thought about it in relation to Thaddeus, yeah, and his whole like village or whatever in the past, yeah. Um, but I, you know, I think maybe it's, you know, they, they, both of those characters sort of romanticize the past in, in a lot of ways. Like Helen, you know, even though this vase that she's looking at is kind of the same vase from the past that we kind of just saw this parable where we, it was disposable. Mm -hmm. uh, and mass produced but to her it's on the it's on the pedestal in the museum and so beautiful and special and she and and then she thinks that you know her time is sort of, sort of like disposable and meaningless or whatever but then in the in the future um you know he's sort of looking looking back and and ideal, idealizing her times and the customers and what great people they were and um and I, a lot of that is just me sort of feeling like, yeah, I, I grew up in a town that was like mostly shopping centers and, and I always sort of felt like I didn't come from anywhere or I didn't have a culture or something. And that like, you know, the past was, a room, I go to the museum and you see this, the statues and the carvings and you're like, no, those were, those were real people or something, you know? And it's like kind of wanting to, you know, place myself in, in the long line of human history and be like, oh, we're, we're, we are also people. We also make yeah. this, there's no real, it all is, you know, like we talked about this, Sasha, just like it all is, it all is a part of the isness. And it's like, you know, maybe some things are more valuable or meaningful than others, but you know, it's um, even, even the things that are disposable are here and are real and are ours and will be found. And, you know, I think, sort of want, wanting to like infuse some some meaning into these things that felt disposable. We do have one question from Tom. Yeah. Oh, you've done. Yeah. Sorry, everyone. This is Tom Lee from the Chicago Puppet Festival. Um, thank you so much, Sasha, Robin, and Julie for this awesome um, uh, discussion. We've, we're having a couple questions come in through HowlRound. And also at this point, we want to invite anybody inside the Zoom meeting to unmute themselves. And if you'd like to ask a question to one of the panelists, you can um, choose the, um, the uh, um, reaction button and raise your hand digitally, or you can just raise your real hand. Um, <laughs> But let's start, first of all, here's a question coming from Stephen, um, who's watching live on HowlRound. 
And Stephen is asking about their own personal experience as a consumer. As a consumer, I've sorted plastic, metal, and paper separately from other landfill garbage. I've done this for years, thinking it's recyclable. I suspect there may be a problem after my disposables are sorted and collected. What can we do to solve this? I mean, I can kind of speak to that, that um, as Sasha has said as well, that, um, you know, there's, there's so much of it and there's just, you know, recycling is a pro is not the answer, but it's not also not, um, it's not a bad thing. I mean, aluminum can be recycled infinitely and, and paper, but it's just that there's so much plastic that we can't, we don't have the infrastructure. And I, I hate to see people lose faith in, in a market for things that can be like glass and recycling for aluminum. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, I mean, I don't know, Sasha, if you can speak to that as well, but it, it's just that our dependence and our thinking that plastic can solve everything, you know, it's, yes, it's, it's um, waste management's problem, but, you know, recyclers are also, you know, MRFs and, and they're trying to do the right thing by finding markets for this, but it's, I don't know, it really needs to be overhauled on so many levels that I do think that um, I hate to see people lose faith, but we've, we've got this disposable convenience that we just do the single, single stream recycling, but, you know, and we need to make manufacturers more responsible for what they're um, making, but Sasha, maybe you can answer that a little bit more Sorry. eloquently. <laughs> well, actually, I wanted to point people to this book, which I guess with the lighting is hard to see, but it's Recycling Reconsidered by Samantha McBride. It's a great book. She actually uh, rode around with sanitation workers in New York City for a year and um, does art as well, and is talking about the need to disaggregate plastics from other kinds of recycling. So. Recycling aluminum and recycling um, fabric in the beginning was great. The cotton would turn into paper and there could be continuous loops of some of these things. Others were degraded and were downcycled. But at one point it became a word that had so much um, virtue attached to it that the Sorrell report, which was, um, a consulting company that the state of California commissioned to answer the question, where should we put our Lulus, our locally undesired land uses? And how do we get resistance um, overcome by these communities? And this was one of the first in print where they're saying, oh, site in, they were paid to say this in print, cited in low-income communities of color because they don't have the social power to fight back. But the other piece of what they were saying was, call it recycling, and then people won't object. So now we have advanced recycling, chemical recycling, thermal recycling, which is just burning plastics, and we have recycling of nuclear waste. We have recycling of, of things that have no business being recycled because they're inherently toxic, and we're just continuing to move those toxic chemicals into new pathways of exposure. And so I want to reclaim the word recycling and apply it to things that actually can be closed loop recycled. Um, even aluminum cans though now are lined with yeah. uh, polymer, <laughs> right? And foil often has a, a polymer coating on it. So it's really challenging. Paper can be coated with um, PFAS chemicals or you know polyethylene to make it glossy. So it's shifted the whole idea of recycling and what that means. Mm -hmm. But I just want to, share really briefly, which is an idea from um, Samantha McBride's book. She said the best kind of recycling was when you had a pig in your backyard. And when there was food scraps that you couldn't eat, like banana peels, you feed it to the pig. And then at some point you give thanks to the pig and have protein. And so if that works for you with your religious and dietary needs, that was that was a, a circle, but um, Close that's not our system. Are definitely the answer, yeah. But. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one, the recycling market. But um, we do have a question um, as artists. Or can I go ahead with this, Tom? Or yeah, you... I was just going to say there's a question in the in the chat the for chat. you. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, as artists, how can we represent not only the permanence of plastic, but the actual changing of nature? 
In the brilliant plastic bag store, we assume that severe weather is our fault, but the jellyfish he's eating might be part plastic. The ice might be part plastic and it was plastic bags. How do we even think about the anthropogenic markers? So yeah, that's, that's a loaded question. Even yeah. <laughs> so as artists, how can we re represent not only the permanence of plastic, but the actual changing of nature is, yeah, so. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. That's I know that's how I did it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I guess keep um, producing art is one answer, yeah. right? I mean, I, I found it really hard to like write or think about the future. Um, you know, it's like impossible to. We had a lot of discussions when we were creating it of just like, well, what what did this character have? What knowledge did he have? What didn't he, what tools, you know, we were like, but how, how would he have this if he didn't know about that? Or, you know, it was like impossible to like invent something entirely new without all of the things that you know. And also like, how do I convey it to the audience that you know what he's doing? If, you know, he has to be like fishing or he has to have some similar tools at his disposal for the audience to even recognize what he's doing. So it was really hard to like, imagine the future and I, I I definitely all of the like all the like sci-fi stuff and that I like um is when there's not a lot of answered questions you know where everything's kind of vague um there's not a lot of real specific language and it, um you can kind of just leave it up to your imagination about what's going on there or I, I don't say when it is um or exactly what he's doing out there um I have my my own thoughts about it, but I, I yeah I, I think I definitely it's kind of a cop out, but I tried to just <laughs> leave as much to the audience's imagination as possible. Yeah, I, I don't think it was a cop out. I I, think <laughs> I, I I someone who knows a bit about plastic and you know even for Sasha to watch it and, and to be able to get something out of it, I thought it was really beautiful when you had him uh, want to go get more. And he, yeah. you know, he did the scuba diving and then you yeah. had the shelves. I thought that was a really nice way to bring it back to, to present time. I thought that was very effective, so. Okay, Tom. Sorry, we're just getting a, we're just getting a, um, a question from HowlRound from John Bell. And mm -hmm. the question is this, it's kind of puppetry centered. Mm -hmm. Many puppeteers work with paper, cloth, wood, leather, and other materials. This is mostly for Robin. How is plastic to work with both technically and philosophically? Mm. Well, um, it was, it was, you know, I, I, I had made all cardboard projects before um and I, I really like working with just one material and seeing how far you can push it you know just just cardboard glue and knife that I feel like when I'm limited by a material sometimes it it I it get really inspired um as opposed to being like oh you could make anything out of anything and then I'm like I have zero ideas <laughs> but it's like you can make just as anything that's in a city and it's out of cardboard and then I'm just like it can go nuts so it was very fun to try to do this with the new material like with the plastic bags and be like okay it's just plastic bags and stuff that you can make in a grocery store um and you know at first it was kind of frustrating because it I was so used to cardboard's structural um integrity and nice matte finish which I really like <laughs> but uh um but, you know, I learned about it. I definitely had to do some things that probably weren't great for me. Uh, a lot of touching of plastic bags, some taping, some gluing, some melting, some shrinking. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, it's like, I definitely have a different relationship to them than most people probably because, you know, I like despise them, but I also collect them and I also am really like attracted to certain colors and so I also have like a kind of like affinity for plastic bags um you know if, if I see someone with a, a, a unique color plastic bag like walking by I'm like I covet their plastic bag <laughs> um so yeah it's, it's definitely like changed the way that I think about it um as a material you know as you know I hate it but I but I'm also always looking for it you probably have a real fascination with yeah different colored plastic because yeah as you said wasn't was it 
red and orange were the hardest to find. Yeah, I'm, I'm always on the hunt for red and orange too. Yeah. And then you go to different countries and the plastic bags like feel different. And yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Great. That's, an, that's interesting. Do you think you'll continue to work with plastic or? Um, I think my next project will be totally different actually. Yeah. I think I probably shouldn't work with plastic bags for hands-on for the rest of my life. It's probably not that good for me, <laughs> but hopefully this project will continue to have its life and, and to tour around. Yeah. Well, um, are there any other questions, Tom, from? The well, we have one more, um, one more also from um, Nancy on HowlRound, and she's kind of asking um, uh, some of the things that you've addressed, Robin, and her question is about artists specifically. How can artists avoid using these non-recyclable materials? Um, um, popular, uh, popular foam, which is used for a lot of hand puppets, deteriorates and is, is not such a great material. It's bad for museums as well as the environment. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's been an amazing renaissance of cardboard theater and um, paper theater and crankies. Um, uh, what what kind of things would you suggest to artists in terms of their own personal practice? I know we cannot solve the problems all individually ourselves, but what are some maybe good things we can think about as artists making work? Yeah, I mean, I definitely like, you know, part of the thing about making the cardboard and, and the plastic bag stores, all that stuff was free, you know, at least that part of it was, you know, <laughs> gathering those materials. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 unfortunate because some you know not everything in the plastic bag store is made of trash we had to like build some sets and we had to you know um use paint and all you know like all kinds of stuff like that some of it is unavoidable um you know definitely like you know in the puppet world it's hard with the foam and stuff i always like to use old couch cushions for the foam instead of trying to bind it new or you know raiding goodwills and um there's a great place in new york called materials for the arts where you can get like secondhand materials um that people donate um but yeah i mean it's 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 definitely a challenge and you know i i you know like i said we used some new materials to create this show we had to um but it's also like i still felt like it was important you know it's like i should better to do something than not do something. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I, maybe it is that thing where being limited by certain materials will, will, will cause people to be more inspired perhaps, you know? Um, but yeah, I think that is, it's, it, it can be a challenge because as artists, we are often exposed to a lot of nasty things for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Those are, those are good questions I, about the materials that the artists are actually using. I remember, yeah, the styrofoam or polystyrene used to be yeah. a big, you know, because it could manipulate it and melt it down. I remember yeah. using acetone and, and polystyrene in art class in college. Yeah, I had a job uh, <laughs> when I was younger building parade floats and we were just like carving styrofoam and then coating it in Bondo. <laughs> like, I know, good thing. I'm thinking, I'm thinking to myself, good thing there wasn't cameras back then because like someone would put, you know, me a picture of me with a styrofoam now, I'd be like, ah. but uh, yeah, I, I see what you mean about the, the plastic. So yeah, um, I, I think I, what I like is that even through the materials that you're using, you can make a statement. You're, you're using these free materials that are part of society, but um, you know, it doesn't, it's also sending the message that this is free, it's disposable, but maybe we need to be thinking about something else. I, I was listening to a um, talk on, from the Plastic Pollution Coalition, and they have a new campaign about trying to replace plastic water bottles in films and movies and, you know, TV shows and you know, replacing the disposability of things and that just, and I thought that, that that's great. You know, we need it on all levels, right? Yeah, I, I always think it's funny when you watch a movie and it's like in the future, but not like that far, uh, like... <laughs> It'll be something that's just like a hundred years in the future or 50 and then they'll have the same coffee cup lid or like just like they'll still be have like a Starbucks lid or something like, but, but the filmmakers had imagined this whole detailed like moon mining 
situation that was happening, but they couldn't just imagine a different kind of cup. <laughs> lid. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, speaking of kind of like different materials or anything, just because we are talking about plastics, I mean, Sasha, would you like to address it all kind of like, you know, people who are trying to solve single use plastics with bio, um, biodegradable materials. I, I know that's a little bit of a jump from puppet materials, but it's also just how people are trying to address materials in our culture. Um, do you? I think like the word recycling, bioplastic now has so many meanings. Um, I'm thinking of how words like natural and non-toxic have no legally binding meaning. They can be used on labels and same with biodegradable and bioplastic. And so it could either be a plant material that is chemically reduced to its atoms, and then you make something that is identical to what would have been made from fossil fuels. And so the process of making it is exposing those workers to toxic chemicals. And then for the rest of its life cycle, it's it's the equivalent of a fossil fuel plastic. Um, but they're saying it's fossil fuel free because it's made from plants, but those plants in turn are part of industrial agriculture, which is super dependent on fossil fuels for pesticide and fertilizer and all the farm equipment. So it's very complex. Um, we have some bioplastics like polylactic acid that are uh, novel kinds of plastics made from plants designed to degrade more rapidly. But I saw a study in, um, environmental science and technology journal that showed that some of those are more toxic than conventional fossil fuel-based plastics. And so we really need to think critically about what we mean. What are we making it from? What are the intermediaries? What will happen to it when we dispose of it? And what is this idea of you know, using food when we waste so much food and so many people are hungry using food to make packaging that's unnecessary for someone who has too much already. So there's lots of justice issues involved. It's not just a scientific question. Yeah. That's, 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 I know, I know that's not necessarily yet the answer. So I was wondering, I don't know that much about the biodegradable aspect of that, but um, but but speaking where things end up in the, the future, I mean, Robin, what would be your your hope for the plastic bag store? I mean, where it would end up or, you know, it's traveling now again to. Yeah, we're, we're going to go Chicago. to Austin. Yeah, after Chicago, we'll be in Austin in April and hopefully in the Bay Area in the fall. And, um, you know, my hope is that it continues to tour, um, you know. I mean, it would be great if it became ir irrelevant, um, but until it does, I hope it continues to, to tour or to maybe sit down and find a, a long-term home somewhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, well, I know there's, I mean, there's other, and I, not to put Blair on the spot, but he is in the chat, but I know there's other, um, you know, shows in the Puppet Fest, right, Blair, that are addressing kind of our environmental impact um, timber and then there's um, tie to foes piece. How important do you think it is to include these type of shows in a puppet festival or an art forum? Wow, well, you know, it's, uh, it, it's something as a, as a as the leading to curation of the festival, it's something I'm really uh, putting front and center is, is finding puppet artists who are uh, grappling with content that's that's uh, uh, very re relevant to today and, and very uh, addressing issues today and and allowing puppetry as a form as a, as a as the, the uniqueness of puppetry as a as a material performance practice to uh, address these things in ways that other forms can't and uh, this is uh, to me always so interesting because Robin uh, in her plastic bag store piece is is, uh, is taking materiality like this thing that every puppeteer is is in in, in, a, in a constant dialogue with and the, the relationship to how to uh, actualize in the world their vision in a in a fabricated replica of of of, 
of the idea um, with some form of materiality in that once that happens, it has its own autonomy from the human world and it's, it becomes the unique thing that puppetry is, that, it's, that it's, it stands outside of us and but it but it's, it's it looks like a, it has a, re a reflective uh, mirror for us to see ourselves in and and uh, so uh, the kind of material that you use is is not irrelevant and uh, the, the materials you're actually working with and and touching like when Robin talks about I should maybe stop touching this stuff <laughs> um, <laughs> this this stuff to work with I can completely relate to that you know. Um, uh, but it's also uh, something that that has has meaning. Um, uh, it uh, or has specific ramifications for the for the viewer, and um, so I, uh, in the festival we have uh, also we have Timber, which is a, a piece that's premiering next weekend by Rootstock Puppet Theater. Mark Blashford leads that, and it's um, he's looking at deforestation in, in North America. Um, through a revisioning of the Paul Bunyan myth. Um, uh, but Mark is a puppet artist who, who's a wood carver and he's all about taking wood and carving it. And, and so he's, he's, he's just killing trees to make puppets already, you know, it's already going down, right? And, um, but at the same time, there's, you feel something different about, about you, you can feel the, the quality of the wood in his performances, you can you can feel the way the puppet moves. You can feel the way it moves across the stage, the way it sounds against its, its it, when it touches itself, and um, that's um, that that that's important for the for the piece. At the same time, it, it's about the piece is about that, you know. And um, uh, uh, you know, for sure, there's the it, even the Bread and Puppet Theater's work is as a company that works rurally and works close to the land and is. Uh, it, it sees um, theater as being essential as bread, and uh, and that you know to to uh, work as much as possible with uh, the the materials that are readily available, the recycled material of that whole idea. In the same way that Robin is is scouring around to find the the usable former container that held the sausages. Uh, so that she can put it into her. <laughs> That's just a, such a great little detail. Like, oh, that was actually how to sausage in it. Um, and uh, is in the same way, Peter Schumann is is collecting bed sheets constantly. So that then the guy's just painting large bed sheet banner, banner paintings all the time. He has tons of them, and they appear in his shows. And and that tradition is of using two dimensional painting. Uh, in performance is a totally interesting one that goes back to the Renaissance and in, in in European culture. And uh, but it's a, it's a you know it's like you're in the presence of it. It's not a projection. It's a large painting, and so there's that that materiality is is significant in that way. So um, uh, it starts to starts to communicate differently, specifically like then the to have an image that's. That that is, you know, rendered in this way, and that in that you know, it's you can feel the roughness of it, in in Bread and Puppet's case because of of how the materials have traveled and and been used and reused, and now they're being used in this context. You know, it's a it's a um, it, I don't know it, it it with a little awareness by the audience, you start to you start to see into uh, that in a different way. I, an idea that I really like that's in Robin's piece is the philosopher's, uh, uh, you know, observation that knowledge is virtue, yeah. and as a, this really simple thing that he says, and and yeah. the, the protagonist of the story is uh, thinks, oh, that sounds great. That's got a great ring to it. Yeah. Um, and, and that is goes, great. And then to have that come back on the bus stop, I just really. I really I admire how you wrapped things around and then I mean even uh, putting plastic inside the boxes you, is that that you collect that was all collected as well right yeah. I, I which really wasn't probably necessary but why did you feel that that was important to put them in the freezer um boxes and stuff yeah, I, I mean just, I love it I was just like, I wanted it to be real you know I you know I knew people were going to pick them up and shake them and stuff yeah 
I, yeah, Fisherman's Catch was one, yes. was one of my favorites. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I just, um, I want to encourage everybody if they haven't gone yet to, to see the show. I mean, um, you know, it's not just the story you want to see, you want to see the actual film and the whole, you know, you know, presentation. It's just, it leaves you blown away. And to have it part of the Puppet Fest is wonderful. Um, and, and Blair, thank you for, you know, your perseverance in getting this festival to all of us and, and, and to be able to have live performance and to, and to see the excitement on people's face on opening night. I mean, I've gotten so many texts that are like, send me your pictures, send me this. It's, it, it really brought life to me. And I know it's making so many people happy to be able to have a discussion like this. And um, if for anybody listening and um, next weekend, there's two more symposiums and the festival continues all the way to January 30th. The Plastic Bag Store is at Wrigley Building through January 30th. And Robin is there daily <laughs> for the shows <laughs> several times. And, and Sasha, thank you so much for your commitment and your depth of knowledge on the plastic you know, problems and solutions that we have to offer. I mean, I think if we have more people like this coming at it from so many directions, there's, there is, there's hope for, for the, what we leave behind, right? <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Julie. Thank okay. you. All right, see you at the festival. Okay. All Bye. Right. Bye. Okay. All right. Oh, we're still live, I see. We're still recording.